there's some discussion about IV stem cell in augmentation. What are your What are your thoughts on that? Is, is there benefit? Is it dangerous? There's also some discussion in the space about exosomes. I would love to hear your take on some of those uh, alternative sure. treatments. Right. And th those are areas that the FDA has concerns about yeah. because, again, if you take IV um, therapy from umbilical cord stem cells, that's a drug. And that, that would have to go through a, a formal FDA process for, to, to achieve a claim as a treatment. And to the best of my knowledge, there, there's nothing on the market yet that has gone through that process. And people who are going outside the country. Yeah. You know, I would discourage that. You know, your your own cells are made for you. Now a word from our sponsor, Better Help. That's Better H E L P. And what could be better than getting Better Help? Again, just coming in hot with the jokes. Here's why better help is great. We have to take care of our mind if we're so focused on taking care of our body. One does not exist without the other. I've gotten therapy. I recommend therapy all the time to my patients. It is critical. It is just as important as everything that you are doing, like exercise and nutrition and sleep, how our brain works is pivotal. So what are you going to do? Number one, if you're going through something, you shouldn't go through it alone. We're more disconnected than we've ever been, and this is where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp is an online therapy, offers video, phone, even live chat only. So you can do a live chat only therapy session if that's what you feel the need to do. You don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It is very affordable. It's much more affordable than an in-person therapy session, although those are great too. You can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Listen, you don't get any medals for suffering in silence and suffering alone. I definitely don't recommend it. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at Better help.com slash Dr. Lion. That's betterhelp.com slash Dr. Lion. It is an online therapy support. It is extremely helpful. Again, do not suffer alone. Head on over to betterhelp.com slash Dr. Lion and get 10% off your first month. Greg Lutz, welcome to the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon show. I'm really excited to have you on because you are a regenerative expert. And people are very unfamiliar, I think, in general, about regenerative medicine. And it's really a very proactive approach to healing. And I'm just going to read a little bit about you. And you are a physiatrist in chief emeritus at the Hospital for Special Surgery. And for you guys that don't know this, HSS is considered one of the best in the world. You also are part of Weill Cornell Medical College which is incredible. And you are a pioneer in regenerative therapy, which this is what this show is all about. You've written many scientific studies and contributed to the body of work quite tremendously. So thank you so much. Well, thanks so much for having me, Gabrielle. It's a kind of a real pleasure to have the opportunity to, to you know, share the message about other options for patients than drugs and surgery for their chronic back pain. Let's talk about what is chronic pain? You know, chronic pain is usually defined by pain that, that doesn't go away after, you know, three months. And, you know, that that's when it starts to, you know, the natural healing process didn't correct the problem and you're living with a fair amount of discomfort, changing your activities of daily living, getting more anxious because you don't, you don't know what's going on. And then, you know, you start looking for solutions and sometimes you look for solutions in the wrong places. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we know with back pain that, you know, drugs and surgery are typically palliative treatments that, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, getting patients the relief they want for the long term. And also when you say palliative treatment, it's essentially a bandaid. It's this revolving door of, now you're dealing with uh, injections that potentially are limited and then medications, which medications over time can be debilitating for people, especially pain medication is an addiction component. And also it really affects cognitive function um, as individuals age, which I I'm sure you've seen. So how did you get interested in back? 
back and pain in general? You know, when I came to um, hospital for special surgery um, back in the early 90s, you know, they were they were looking for a a specialist to manage patients better non-surgically because so much of the hospital's focus is on the surgical, you know, correction of deformities and and joint replacement surgeries and sports surgeries. And so I, I was brought in to say, well, how, how can we optimize the rehabilitation of patients? How can we optimize the non-surgical treatments? And a lot of that, you know, original time period was spent developing minimally invasive techniques to guide injections of anesthetic and steroids into, into difficult places in the spine. And then over the past 15 years, that's when I, you know, we, we evolved into more of the regenerative treatments, you know, using the same, you know, interventional techniques, but using things that actually can create a cure if we put them in the right place at the right time. That's incredible. Say that again. Things that can actually create a cure because the cure, like getting pain relief is important, but getting structural healing of the tissue that's damaged is really when you might get a cure. And that's what we need to do. And I think that we need to shift the, the treatment paradigm away from invasive surgeries and, and drugs with a lot of side effects to really more natural ways of healing. And there's nothing better than using your own cells to create that um, process. And how does that work in terms of, you said using the cells. And by the way, I've had PRP in multiple areas in my body. I've had some significant sporting injuries that have caused pain and damage. And uh, uh, I'm very familiar with the process. I would love for you to take the listener or the viewer through what that actually looks like. You know, it's, it's really a very simple process. And, you know, when we, just to give an analogy, when we cut our skin, you know, the first cells that go to the wound are platelets. And platelets release their growth factors, which signal stem cells to come to the wound, remodel the tissue, and regenerate the tissue. So when there's damage to tissue that has a good blood supply, that process is pretty much on autopilot. The, the problem that arises is when a tissue that has a poor blood supply gets damaged, and then the healing can be often incomplete or very poor. And structures that have poor blood supplies in the body are typically tendon tissue, cartilage tissue, and, and disc tissue. And, and the disc is actually the largest structure in the body that has the least amount of blood you know, very poor blood supply. So, so the process, when we originally thought about using PRP, it was only after we saw such nice results with healing tendon tissues, where we would, you know, take the patient's blood, we would spin it in the centrifuge, concentrate the cells to very high levels, and precisely put them into tendons under ultrasound guidance, and then re-image and see if the, the pain relief was correlating with structural healing. And so the same collagen that makes up a tendon makes up some of the outer rings of a disc. And, and so that's when we translated, made, that, made that, that jump from tendons to disc tissue. But it was really just simple, you know, um, pathophysiology or biology of tendons and collagen and healing. Yeah. You know? you know, and for the listener, people are thinking, okay, well, what are my tendons? What kind of injury would that be? And I would say, you know, for me, I had a, an avulsion of my hamstring. So I tore the tendon of my hamstring over 80%. And I did two years of PRP in terms of uh, initial treatment. It was a very large tear over a period of time. Basically, they come in, they draw your blood, they spin it down, and they inject it into the tendon exactly the, the way in which you're just describing under ultrasound. What other areas of the body would be a, um, a common area of injection? So if someone is sitting at home saying, wow, I have back pain, which nearly everybody I know, every single one of my patients at some point or another, will talk about that. And then also the athletes in the military, all these guys from jumping out of planes over a lifetime really ultimately get injured. 
What are some other areas and, and kind of uh, as it relates to injury, would you say that PRP for, from a tendon standpoint? Oh, from tendon standpoint, you know, the, the common areas that we typically treat are rotator cuff in the shoulder. Um, we do a lot of gluteus medius tendons in the hip, hamstring tendons, patellar tendons, which are really common in jumping sports, Achilles tendons, uh, which are also common in, in runners. And so the, the, those are the most common areas that we treat with PRP. And what is the threshold for uh, treatment? For example, if someone comes to you and they say, oh, um, this is starting to aggravate me, would you go right to PRP? Do you have to see a certain uh, percentage of tear? What does that look like or tissue injury? Typically, you know, if it doesn't heal within six weeks, we're starting to think about, you know, offering an orthobiologic option like PRP. And, and really the, the, if the tendon is, is grossly disrupted, you're not like your, your tendon would be a hard one to treat because it was an avulsion, but there must've been something left as a strut to get some healing. So, but if you have a completely torn Achilles, um, you're not a great candidate, but most patients come in with partial tears and, and those are the ones that are very good candidates that, you know, if we can catch it early and get it to heal, then it doesn't go on to a complete tear. So, so it's usually either through ultrasound or through MRI imaging, we can see the degree of tear and patients with rotator cuff tendinosis, which is more just inflammatory changes that aren't responding to physical therapy. You know, those are also a very good candidate. And would you say someone who is lifting or doing some kind of activity and maybe, you know, shoulders are so common, especially as individuals get into their 40s. It's one of the most it's one of the most common surgeries. Thank you to Element for sponsoring this episode of the show. That's Element and it's spelled L-M-N-T. I want to tell you about an experience that I had. Now, I love Element. I drink it all the time. Sometimes I go through two packets a day. I've recently been in a moving packing spree. And you know how there's kind of random packets of things? Oh, I don't know if there is for you, but there definitely is for me, the, the random packet. I could not throw out my element packet. So I threw it in with random box of clothing. I'm sure I'm going to find little surprises of element packets throughout my house because I did not want to throw out any of element. How do I use it? I use it post-training. I use it in the morning. It is a great electrolyte solution with no junk in it. It has 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. It is formulated to help anybody with their electrolyte needs. So if you are one of those people that sit on the sofa and randomly contract your hamstring or your calf. Not that I'm one of those people, but I might be. And then it immediately cramps up. Potentially, you have not been drinking enough fluids and replacing the right kind of fluids like electrolytes. So do not be in that position. When you sweat, you do have to replace not just water, but also some of the other electrolytes. This is why I love Element. You can head on over to drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion. That's drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion and get your eight single serving packets free with any order. Do Would you say if you are starting to feel some irritation that you go early as yes. opposed to push through it? Um, it, it it's such a nice, it, this is such a safe treatment that can change the natural history to the to the to a more favorable one that if you're having pain you know it's so easy to get evaluated with an ultrasound and see how the tendon is doing because sometimes it's just a bursitis you know it's the, the cup the rotator cuff looks good and and, the, and it may just be a bursitis and that responds very simply to a simple cortisone injection and some postural changes with exercise mm-hmm. so so but that's i think the the reason i wrote the book as it relates to the spine is because in the spine, you know, we don't want your spine to degenerate. And, you know, there's this concept of the degenerative cascade because when the disc starts to degenerate, you know, then the spinal segment develops instability and then you develop deformity and then you start getting nerve compression. And so what we've seen, if we can intervene early and stop that process with, a good injection of PRP into the disc to, to stabilize that column, then hopefully we can prevent long-term um, sequelae of a degenerative cascade in the spine. 
And I think that's, that's a really good message is, you know, if you're having pain, it's not responding or it's not healing within three to six weeks, get evaluated. Mm. And in terms of back pain and back degeneration, is that something that everybody goes through? Is that considered a normal process of aging? No, it's not normal. And it's not, not, not everyone goes through it. And I think that, you know, there's a lot more uh, we've learned about this degenerative process. And just like we have a microbiome in our, in our um, gut, we have a microbiome in the disc. And what we're seeing is we thought the disc was a sterile environment. It's really not. Hmm. You know, there's a studies that have shown that there's over 400 different species of bacteria in the disc and that a lot of degeneration has been linked to an overgrowth of certain types of bacteria. Wow. And so when we do this intradiscal PRP, we're using a preparation that has a very high, high white blood cell count. It's called a leukocyte rich PRP. And so we may be killing two birds with one stone with our treatment because the platelets have growth factors which stimulate collagen healing, but then the leukocytes may be suppressing some of the overgrowth of abnormal bacteria in the disc that has been linked to disc degeneration. I have never heard that before. That is yeah. fascinating. It's, it is fascinating. And it, I've only learned it over the past few years. Hmm. And so, and you can, you can see how that concept of the disc not being a sterile environment doesn't, you know, set up well for putting spinal implants into the spine, hmm. you know, because, and I think that's one of the reasons a lot of the fusions fail is because these implants develop biofilm so that these patients are having persistent pain and loosening after their surgeries. And I'm also guessing that that sets up for subsequent inflammation, low-grade inflammation in the body, and perhaps this degenerative cascade or the decline in health also contribute uh, unknowingly to um, yeah, there's finding a, there was health. A yeah. There was a fascinating study out of, um, I think it was India, that actually took samples from normal young, healthy discs, and they use sophisticated DNA analysis, and they were able to identify over 424 different species of bacteria inside a normal disc. And so that, that was very eye-opening. And, and then, you know, there's a lot of data now that suggests that, you know, cutie bacterium acnes, which is the same bacteria that causes acne, has been linked to disc degeneration. How would the next logical question would be, is, does nutrition interventions or oral intake interventions have any input or impact within that microbiome of the disc? Oh, I I believe it it will. I believe it does. And I think as we get more sophisticated, you know, uh, ability to, to link with AI, um, there's definitely a, a gut disc access that we see. And, and, you know, and there's a higher risk for infection in younger male um, patients in the spine because of this, you know, overgrowth of cutie bacterium acnes. Wow. So, so I think that there's a lot we, we are only beginning to understand, you know, the role that bacteria play in disc degeneration. And it's not a normal process. Mm-hmm. Meaning it's not a normal process. So similarly to the gut, when the gut has some kind of small intestinal overgrowth or fungal overgrowth, that is not a normal environment. And you're saying that that environment exists within the spinal column and even more specifically within those discs in the back. Exactly. Wow. In terms of treatment and in terms of the early onset of treatment, you said that you use a, a PRP that is high in white blood cells. Do you augment it with anything else like growth, other growth factors or, um, you know, I'm sure that people have asked about uh, growth hormone and any other kinds of perhaps peptides. Do you utilize any of those? You know, um, right now we're, we're, we're limited when we use like the FDA doesn't regulate, you know, PRP, but once you start adding things, then it becomes a drug and then it's a completely different path to market. So, but, you know, within each one of us, 
you know, our platelets contain, contain thousand different prote- proteins. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we have our own unique genetic code of healing peptides and proteins that, you know, do the work in our bodies. And so the beauty of this is that it's like a soup. You're putting in, you know, very rich concentration of platelets with, you know, we're probably, when we inject into a disc with our newer systems, we're putting in five to 10 billion platelets, probably 50 to 100 million white blood cells in a two teaspoon aliquot. So it's very concentrated and it contains many things that we're, we're only beginning to understand which ones ha- are the most important. Does the health of the individual make a difference of the outcome of the treatment? Meaning if an individual has a, we'll just say diabetes, so if they have a a blood sugar regulation issue, so that's kind of one silo of an individual. And then the other uh, group of individuals, I would think if they have any kind of uh, occult infection or that was occult, for example, Lyme, do you think that that diminishes the treatment? Should an individual try to address any kind of underlying illness prior to treatment? Does that affect outcomes, clinical outcomes? I don't think there's any studies yet on that, but clinically, I think it's 100% true. Mm-hmm. Like the healthier you are, the more powerful your healing cells are. And so, you know, you know going on a low inflammatory diet, you know, seeing a functional medicine specialist to, to optimize your microbiome and, and to correct any nutritional deficiencies and to rule out, you know, any causes of chronic inflammation, like you said, of mm-hmm. limes, those sorts of things is, is, is only going to help the success of the procedure. That's really interesting. I, I want to take a moment to highlight the fact that you are a physiatrist with multiple publications and also um, a highly sought after clinician in some of the most esteemed places. And you mentioned functional medicine, which those two typically are very divergent. And I'm curious as to how you see that integrating and how you even came upon that. And I I will mention one more thing, why I think the listener or the viewer should follow you and learn from you is you're an innovator and innovators always think outside the box. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, I was introduced to functional medicine through my wife, Paula, who is a health coach. She's a, you know, integrative health health coach. And so I would go to some of her conferences just to kind of tag along. And, and that's where I really, you know, uh, that's what piqued the interest. And so I've learned a lot from Paula, and then also, you know, there are a lot of many good physicians in this space, like yourself, that are really promoting good science and and also just getting the word out about a different way of managing healthcare. Mm. And I think, you know, regenerative medicine is one of the fastest emerging fields in medicine, but so is functional medicine. And I think a combination of functional medicine with regenerative treatments can solve so many problems, particularly in orthopedics yeah. and drugs or surgery. In terms yeah. of, you know, you mentioned something, um, you had mentioned earlier the FDA has regulations about what you can and cannot do and how the treatment can be utilized. I think I was driving on one of the turnpikes here right outside New York City, and I saw a billboard and it was advertising stem cell treatment. And I've been to Florida. I've seen a lot of that as well. How does someone pick a provider? Uh, How does someone vet an individual? What are the things that they should look for? And also, why is the space at this time seeming a little bit like the wild, wild west? No, it's it's a good point. And and actually, in my book, there's a whole tra- chapter about how to per, how to um, choose a reputable regenerative spine care physician, mm-hmm. and because there aren't that many, first of all, and but but it, if you go through the process of looking for you know board certification, good training, um, you know, are they publishing their results? Are they contributing to the literature? Are they are they talking at national conferences? You know, those are ways to do it. And I think like 
what the FDA allows us to do, at least in 2023, is take your cells from you and put them, concentrate them with minimal manipulation and put them back into you the same day. Like that's, the, that's the guideline. If you go, if you go around that or beyond it, if you start adding things, then you're, then you're going to be looking at, you know, a full FDA trial because that, that will be treated like a drug. So, so, so the FDA is definitely um, cracking down on some of the, the wild west players in this industry, but it's, it's not unlike other industries that are young and new. There's a learning curve. And I think that it's beginning to tighten. And also as the data starts to build the good scientific data, I think then it, it's easier to, to choose the right provider, but, but don't be lured by advertisements. And you know, that's usually not the best way to get medical care. And there's some discussion about IV stem cell in augmentation. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Is, is there benefit? Is it dangerous? There's also some discussion in the space about exosomes. I would love to hear your take on some of those uh, alternative so, treatments. Right, and th- those are areas that the FDA has concerns about yeah. because, again, if you take IV. Um, therapy from umbilical cord stem cells, that's a drug. And that, that would have to go through a, a formal FDA process for, to, to achieve a claim as a treatment. And to the best of my knowledge, there, there's nothing on the market yet that has gone through that process. So, and people who are going outside the country, yeah, you know, I would discourage that, you know, your, your own cells are made for you. They're, they're the safest. And I think that until um, companies that are promoting that or providers that are promoting it, um, go through the FDA process, I, I would stay away from it. If you catch someone early with back pain, what percentage of individuals do you think will get a full resolution? And do you typically see injury in multiple discs? What, what is the length of time for healing? So for example, if someone is highly athletic and they're thinking, I have never heard of this microbiome in the spine. I've had chronic back pain. I went to my physician. They sent me over to orthopedics. They've told me there's only two treatments available, number one, drugs, number two, surgery. In terms of possibility of healing, catching it early on, you said cure. Is that the typical outcome for people? You know, when we when we first um, did our first um, double blind randomized control trial, our success rate was about 60%. And success was defined by uh, statistically significant improvement in pain and function and pa- patient was satisfied. And, and just to put it in perspective, the control group only got 18%. So there was a, a very big delta. So, so, but 60% is not good enough. But to, to give more background, these were patients that were in pain on average for, for four to five years that nothing had worked. And they were looking at a spinal fusion. And so we said, you know, and this was the, you know, using a, a first generation PRP system. And so what we said was, you know, what we, we went back to the drawing board and said, well, if we can concentrate the platelets to higher levels, you know, would it yield a better outcome? So, so instead of injecting one to 2 billion, what if we injected five, to 10 billion. And that improved the success rate now to about over 80%. You know, greater degree of pain relief and greater degree of um, functional improvement. And then the last innovation we just made was we noticed that when we inject the cells, to, to get it into the back of the disc is very hard with a straight needle technique. So we invented a, a, a catheter that's made of a flexible metal called nit- nitinol. And now we can navigate a catheter directly in the back of the disc and, and cover all the painful tears with a very high concentration of PRP. And now we're seeing really good results, structural healing. And, and it's that combination of therapy that we would like to do an FDA study on now, and get a claim so we, so we can get reimbursement so that this can be a standard of care treatment. So, so it's a long journey to get something that's a, you know, from bench to bedside, and it, this has been twelve years, and but we're almost there. And I think you know, hopefully, 
this year or next year, we'll be able to start an FDA trial to get a claim. And so, but right now, I tell patients our success rate based on our last study was 81%. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. I'm super grateful to Inside Tracker. And it really makes a lot of sense on this episode of the show because Dr. Lutz and I talk a lot about inflammation and how inflammation can impair healing. Dr. Lutz always looks at blood work prior to treatment prior to these platelet-rich therapies. It's a great idea to know your inflammatory markers, to know the health of your body, because by knowing the health of your body, you can predict how one is going to heal. So rather than waiting for an issue, it's really important to check it out prior, knowing the baseline level of inflammation in your body, knowing some of your red blood cells, white blood cells, iron panels, knowing these things are really, really critical. You can learn it for yourself. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off their entire store. And you can look at the markers that we're talking about. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off. Certain states have mobile phlebotomy, so you don't even have to go anywhere. You can go online, click, 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 pick out what plan you want, schedule a mobile phlebotomist to come to your house to get your blood. That's incredible. It's created by leading scientists in aging, genetics, biometrics. Inside Tracker offers a great service. So insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off. That's incredible. And in terms of mechanism of action, when someone, perhaps for providers that are listening to this, there, it sounds like it's a dual component. So number one, it's impact on restructuring the microbiome within the disc. And number two, allowing for tissue healing with perhaps lower, uh, I don't know if the blood supply is lower, but regardless, better tissue healing from the platelet-rich plasma. Is there any other mechanism, any other primary mechanism? You know, I, th- I think the way this, this works is that those proteins within the platelets, if, if you get them close enough to the periphery of the disc where the tears are, it, it stimulates a... a um, cellular response t- to heal the tear because we we actually have an MRI in the office, so we've part of our protocol is to do an MRI before the procedure, do the procedure, and then reevaluate in three to six months to see if if the not, not only is the patient better but also is there any structural healing. And so, and what we've noticed is as we've gone up to higher concentrations of platelets and better delivery the chance for healing has also gone up. And so the catheter was just approved last year. And so, you know, we're still in the early stages of looking at that data, but qualitatively the data looks very good with regards to the MRI. And who is this not for? For example, back pain caused by spinal stenosis. Are there other um, issues that would not be appropriate for PRP treatment? Like if you look at back pain as a bucket, there's a hundred different causes, but by far the most common is a problem with the disc. Let's say the disc represents 40 to 50% of chronic low back pain patients. But then as the disc degenerates, then the ligaments get thick, the joints get larger, the canal gets tighter, as you mentioned, spinal stenosis, and then... Um, you can also develop deformity like scoliosis or, or a slippage of the spine called spondylolisthesis. And so this is really a treatment mainly for early stage disc disease. And, you know, we, we are trying to broaden the indications, but the data that we've published is really on early stage disc disease. People who have, you know, primarily degenerative discs that are still have 50% of their height. If it's, if it's flat like a pancake, you're not a candidate. If you have severe spinal stenosis, you're not a candidate. If you have a large extruded disc, you're not a candidate. You know, we do are we are exploring, you know, PRP epidurals instead of steroid epidurals, but we don't have data on that yet. And, and you know, so I think that there may be a role for stenosis patients for for a PRP epidural that might work better without the steroid load. But I think um, the goal is to prevent the stenosis, prevent the degeneration. 
that's why we want to get the word out. And someone would be able to prevent it by getting an early, getting treatment, having imaging done. And I know that there is a financial barrier because, again, you are working on being able to present the data to get these things covered, which often takes time. You know, we, you've been working on this for 12 or so years, which in medical science is actually not that long. It's a, it's a newer uh, understanding, these things, and it's, it's evolving. But, uh, you know, we send people all the time to get evaluated, to get PRP, and we've seen tremendous outcomes. The key is getting it early and not waiting um, and then, and then also, if an individual has had surgery, would they also be a PRP candidate? So uh, what percentage of back surgeries fail in terms of uh, pain? I think, you know, it depends on the type of surgery, you know, but I think in general, like the most successful type of spine surgery is just a simple micro discectomy where they take the extruded disc out and, and they, you know, they, that's usually like an overnight or same day surgery. And, but there's still, that usually relieves the leg pain, but it doesn't do much to keep the disc healthy. And so we have treated a number of patients after discectomies with intradiscal PRP to relieve their back pain. And then in patients with spinal fusions, you know, over time, the disc above the fusion or below the fusion starts to break down. So we're using PRP to, tr to try to keep those, those segments healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think, so those are the types of patients that we treat after surgery. But from a standpoint of the success rate of a spinal fusion, I think it's a 50-50, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that that's something that, you know, isn't really a root cause treatment for a degenerative disc. Right. If we think that the, the, the process is an unhealed wound inside the disc that has bacteria, then a spinal fusion is not the right treatment. And I think that's what we're trying to do is educate people that, you know, and shift the paradigm based on a root cause treatment, which is something that is similar or analogous to intradiscal PRP. Do you believe that the overarching cause of some of these issues, you know, I say some because obviously there's things outside, you know, structural or, or otherwise, is the microbiome? Do you think if you were to say the number one cause of back pain is microbiome related? I don't think we're there yet. We don't know enough. I, I think the microbiome definitely plays a role. And I think, you know, like the types of patients I see, um, a lot of them get injured in the weight room. Like I really, you know, like they, they start getting stronger, their form you know, deadlifts are like great for my business. Like I see a lot of yeah. deadlifting injuries. I see a lot of power squat injuries. And then, you know, even with young, um, you know, adolescents, you know, that are, they're working with strength, strength coaches and they think they got injured in their lacrosse game, but actually their injury, you look at their MRI, they have two degenerative discs. That's not from lacrosse. That's from deadlifts and, and overdoing it in the weight room and tearing the disc with excessive load. And so I think, I think the role the bacteria plays is when the disc tears, the body may be bringing in some abnormal bacteria, and I think that has a role. So, so I, I you know, I don't think we fully understand. I, I can't say the microbiome is number one cause um, because I think a lot of it is is injury. You know, they're they're injured from motor vehicle accidents, falls, sports, and the disc tears, and it just never heals. And and part of the reason that the disc never heals may be related to this insult in the microbiome or the, the bacteria. Very possible. Very possible. But I think, I think it, it also explains why some patients have more severe pain, but the MRI looks very similar. And I think, it's, I think that's where the bacteria play a, a, a role because bacteria cause severe inflammation, severe inflammation sensitizes nerves and makes those discs more painful. Mm. That's, that's so fascinating. In terms of uh, treatment cadence, would someone come in, obviously um, this varies depending on the injury and what, you know, how many discs need to be treated. 
does someone come in for one treatment of say two or three discs and then wait six weeks and then come in for another? What is the cadence of treatment? You know, we, we actually have published a study and with five to nine year outcome of patients and 71% had long-term relief with a single procedure. So we're not repeating that's, this. That's, that's incredible. That's incredible. Right. So the, and the only reason, like we can treat multiple levels. That's not an issue. Um, you know, we most commonly we're treating probably two levels, but some, sometimes we, we, if the discs look bad and the patient has pain, you know, we will treat more than uh, one level. And I think what, what we typically do is give it three to six months because some people... Most people will feel improvement in the first four to eight weeks, but that pr- improvement continues for up to six months. So I say, just give it six months, work on your rehab, get stronger. And then I would say we, we would repeat it only if the patient had good relief, but it was partial. If they get no relief, I, I wouldn't repeat it. And, but if they get, you know, 50% and they want more then you know, it, it, there's no harm in doing a booster injection. And I think that what we see with that is further improvement. So, and, then, and then how long after do can they be physically active again? Or do you recommend that they never go back to their the loads unless their mechanics are perfect? What is the uh, subsequent outcome in terms of activity? You know, I, I really use that structural healing timeline. Like if, if, you know, collagen takes four to six weeks to mature. And so during that first three to four weeks, I say walk and swim and heal and just give, you know, you've been in pain for years. Let's try to give it a chance to heal. And then for that second four weeks, they go into a kind of a core stabilization program. Special thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. First Form has a great website. They've got tons of apparel and all kinds of things in their shop. They do have a lot of things that are easy to use for travel. When you travel, it is very difficult to maintain a certain level of nutrition. And that's one of the reasons I love Opti Reds 50. It has a handful of colorful fruits and vegetables, herbs, all blended together. It comes in a nice little single serving size pack. You can throw it in your bag. And that is wonderful because there's no excuse to not get it in. Antioxidants are very, very helpful We live in an environment where there are all kinds of things that affect our health and well-being, including environmental toxins, including the things in which we ingest, all these things. And that is why having good antioxidant support is extremely helpful. And not to mention, I don't know about you, but I am not eating a whole bunch of red fruits and vegetables. I mean, once in a while, I do like berries, but the reality is I'm not getting nearly as much as I should, especially when I am traveling. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion and check out their Opti Reds 50. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion and check out their Opti Reds 50. And then after that, they can start to return to their sports. You know, um, and your book is so interesting. There's uh, a section there on the microbiome and these disc injuries and healing. I I recommend everybody. And and I'll link to your book. Um, So it's just so interesting, uh, very innovative. In terms of oral intake of any kind of prebiotic or anything, have you thought about ways in which potentially could move the needle prior to injury? So if you were to say, Um, you know that you're training and you're working out really hard, add in Saccharomyces boulardii, or there's a potential to perhaps this pro or prebiotic may impact the gut microbiome and balance out the negative. You know, I think if, if they have a abnormality, it should be corrected prior to the procedure. Like, you know, if there is something that their functional medicine physician picked up, that that would in, that would increase their inflammatory response and lower their absorption of nutrients. Then correct it. And I think um, some of the other supplements, like I think you know, vitamin C is great for you know collagen healing. There's some scientific data to support the use of melatonin um, as a stimulator of disc healing. 
And so that's something that you, you can take, you know, five milligrams at night, you know, it's just helps you sleep better. And, and so, and then, you know, collagen protein, if you're having absorption issues and you're having, um, you know, having enough protein in your diet. I think those are all important things for healing. And I think we, we need to learn more about how to optimize the micro, you know, the gut disc access. That's something that is really that area of medicine is in its infancy. And I think with AI, we'll learn a great deal more in the years to come. How do you think AI will do it? It'll just help with the uh, algorithms? Yes. And screen, you know, screening what's important, what's not important. Or what's 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 an abnormal overgrowth? There's actually a very interesting article, and I think it was it was from China, that showed an idiopathic scoliosis. They looked at the gut microbiome, and there was an overgrowth of a very particular bacteria that was associated with scoliosis. So so the, these things are starting to come out, and that was the first for me. I never heard that before. And so I think that, you know, we're going to keep continue to learn, but we do know that, you know, you know, C. acnes or cutie bacterium acnes, you know, is a major player with disc degeneration. And is there an antibiotic that would treat that, would help re reset the gut microbiome? There is, but I think the problem, there's a study where they, they put patients on antibiotics for a hundred days and, and, you know, but to treat back pain with a hundred days of antibiotics, I think isn't good antibiotic stewardship because, you know, there's 580 million people in the world with, with back pain. Can you imagine putting them on that much antibiotic for a hundred days? And, you know, so the, and the data on it was refuted, but, you know, but I think there is, uh, I think doing something in the local environment with a leukocyte rich PRP is more appropriate. That is amazing. That is amazing. And you're a cl uh, practicing clinician. How many days a week are you in clinic? I'm usually in clinic three days a week. And the majority of your patients, are they overall young, healthy men? Do you see a wide spectrum? I see wide spectrum, you know, and I like, I like to see, you know, any musculoskeletal condition. Um, but I, my research is particular, particularly involved in the spine and more specifically in the disc. Mm. Should someone, do you recommend people, let's say, for example, they're highly active, but not in pain. Would you recommend a highly active person, not in pain, who is enjoying doing these lift, you know, whatever lifting that they're doing, come in for potential screening to catch it really, really early? Or would, would that be uh, not a clinical indication? No, we see patients who really, you know, they, they have friends with severe back pain or, or they have a loved one that has had severe back pain. And there is really very little harm in getting an MRI. There's no radiation exposure. And I think that it's a, it's a nice way to screen and, and it gives you an idea of, okay, well, you know, you have really good disc tissue or you don't. So I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with screening. And no, there are no overt contraindications for this procedure. The, the main thing is, you know, if your platelet account is, is low, then that would be a contraindication for whatever reason. And so, you know, but if your platelet count is over 100,000, then you're a candidate for the, and you have, an, you have a history, an exam, and an MRI that are all consistent with a disc uh, problem, then you are a candidate. Mm. Would you ever say if someone has an elevated HSCRP that you would want to see, or, or SED rate, would you want to see these inflammatory markers lower prior to doing it just for better outcomes? Would you say, okay, your SED rate is over 30 and your HSCRP is, I don't know, 10. You don't have a ton of comorbidities, but you are struggling with obesity or X, Y, and Z, which is driving this up. Would you say, go see my wife, spend two months or three months lowering your inflammatory markers, and then we're going to hit your procedure? Yes. We actually check all that before procedure just to make sure. And, and I check it for two reasons. I check it for the reason you mentioned, but then I also, I want to know where the patient is on the remote chance that they were developing an infection. At least I know where they're starting from. And because there are patients that have, you know, no systemic signs of an infection, but then their MRI shows, shows, shows certain changes that might be suggestive of an infection. And those are the patients we want to monitor very closely. So we do get SED rates and CRPs on them 
just as a baseline prior to the procedure, including, you know, platelet count as well. What would be the signs of an infection versus an overt structural change on an MRI? So on the MRI, you, you know, there, there are changes um, called modic changes. And modic changes, we used to th- think they were just inflammatory responses. But when you, there's studies now that show if you biopsy those areas on the, on the MRI that have the modic changes, there's a, there's a 30, 40% growth of C-acne. And so I think that's one, cha- one change that we look for. And it's usually very pathognomonic of a symptomatic level. And what you see on the MRI is you see increased signal on certain spin sequences and decreased signal in the end plate of the vertebral body where it meets the disc. But then there are other changes you can see um, on the disc itself if we think it's a, if it's not, if it's a discitis, mm. you know. And certainly we wouldn't cheat, uh, treat a, and a, a systemic spinal infection yeah, right. with PRP, right. but we may be treating occult infections with PRP um, because of this issue of the overgrowth. It's fascinating. If you were to say, what are the top three things that someone would need to execute for spinal health, what would they be? I think sleep is really important for recovery. I think, you know, minimize your sitting because, you know, we sit way too much and the disc receives its nutrition through compression, relaxation, and not just chronic compression. And then I think from a standpoint of, um, you know, this issue of globesity, lower your, your BMI, you know, lower the stress to your spine. I think that's really important. And then, you know, exercise is so important, but it has to be the right kind of exercise. And I think that there are certain exercises in the weight room. I, you know, I love to work out, you know, with weights and I've done it all my life, but there's certain things that I avoid just specifically to avoid injuring my disc. And the, and the ones I see the most commonly in the office are deadlifting, power squats, are the two, and even leg press. Cause you know, your legs get so strong that the load that it, they can handle that it creates on the spine becomes you know, excessive. Hmm. I think that that's all so valuable. And if you are having pain, which again, there's millions and millions of people with back pain, treat it early. Don't wait. There are other options other than surgical and really heavy medications and also steroid injections, which over time uh, are, are not the best, not the best course of treatment. So, well, Dr. Lotz, thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to link all this information, uh, your book, uh, where else can people, and I, you know, your website, where else can people find you? Uh, they can find me at, um, you know, Regenerative Sports Care Institute in New York City. It's um, our private regenerative medicine clinic, and it's on 88th in between Park and Madison. That's, that's our home. And thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope the listeners have learned something new because I have certainly have over the past few years. Guaranteed, guaranteed that people are going to learn something that they've never heard before. I know that your time is precious. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. (laughs) 